Well, good morning. Welcome to Calvary. So glad that you could be here with us. And uh, as we sing, feel free to stand or sit as you feel comfortable. But if you want to stand while we sing this first song, go right ahead. Lord, we are so grateful that we can come together, that we can be with you. Lord, we are just so thankful that all you need, all you require is us to bring ourselves, Lord, that you have made a way. We just thank you, Lord, and we praise you. And heaven, heaven fall down, spirit, spirit pour out on us all now, heaven fall down.
this world is not my home. I'm here but for a moment. It's all I've ever known. But this world is not my home. The fight is not my own. He's burned
And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing so grateful that we can just come before you, Lord, that all you ask is ourselves. Lord, that, that somehow simply giving ourselves is enough to come into your presence and to live with you, to be with you, to experience life with you. Lord, it's all we have. It's all we can give. And you made it possible that it's enough. We thank you and we praise you. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, why don't you say hello and good morning to some people around you. If you would like to financially support the ministry of Calvary Chapel Casa Grande, there are three simple and safe ways for you to give. First, you can give through our app or website by navigating to the giving page. You can either go to calvarycg.org give or scan the QR code on the screen or download our app from your favorite app store. Second, you can text to give. Text the word GIVE to 520-650-5433. Third, there are boxes located inside the sanctuary where you can place cash or a check made out to Calvary Chapel Casa Grande. Thank you for your generosity. Because of you, ministry happens at Calvary Chapel and lives are being changed. Well, good morning, everyone. You know what's even better than the nice, cool mornings that we've been having lately? Is we have our winter family coming back, <laughs> which is really great, really great. Well, I've got some announcements for you, some exciting announcements. The first one is uh, our 242 life groups, small groups, they're getting ready to kick off in October. So if you haven't signed up for one of those groups, please take advantage of that. Those are like instrumental part of the part of this ministry. They're like little church fellowships there that they share. They go through life with each other. They share in each other and they study the word of God and uh, they pray for each other. So they're they're literally vital as part of this ministry. So if you've never uh, been part of one, you have the opportunity. There's a sign up uh, table in the foyer for that. Or you can go to our uh, web page at calvarycg.org forward slash life groups. Uh, but like I said, those are getting ready to kick off here very quickly. Uh, next announcement has to do with our Harvest Festival coming up October 31st. And we've got literally thousands of these cards printed up for you all to hand out to family, family, friends, neighbors, people at the store, and just invite them to come over and be part of what uh, the celebration, the festival that's going to be going on here October 31st. And so we're expecting and really wanting to pack this whole campus for that. And a lot of fun things for no matter what age you are, from the children, uh, everybody's hungry then. So we got lunch trucks are going to be out back. There's a lot of exciting things to be on there. Another way that you could help out with that. You remember when we, when we were doing VBS before, we used to have those lines out there with all the, on the pa pieces of paper on there. Hey, if you can uh, donate certain things. There's a table out there for the... Harvest Festival has got a bunch of slips of paper in there that maybe if you can help out to make that a better celebration for people as we're celebrating life, celebrating the gospel, uh, and um, 
So they have little things on each one of these. You just go take a look at them, see if that's something that you can help them uh, help donate uh, to what we're doing that night. Also, we're, we've get, been getting more candy in. We need a lot more candy, <laughs> okay? So if you can help out with that, that would be really, really great because we are going to be giving away a boatload, I could say, of candy that evening. So, uh, And be praying for the festival, that, that the Lord would just send us you know, thousands of people into this campus through the whole thing. And uh, again, they would have the opportunity to see the, the, maybe the Bible come alive through a couple of the skits that are going on or just have some time to have fellowship together. Also, if the Lord has gifted you in a little, maybe a couple different areas, maybe something you want to share with the congregation, whether it's a song, poetry, a skit, maybe paintings that you've done, uh, well, that opportunity is coming up uh, this coming Friday, okay? Uh, Friday, uh, September 29th on our Open Mic Fellowship Night. It's going to be from 6 to 9 o'clock uh, at night. If you have something that you're going to share, do me a favor. Get hold of us by email, freegrace at calvarycg.org so that we can organize and see who all is coming in so we can plan the evening for that. Also, one I uh, wanted to bring up is just a reminder uh, for our uh, uh, missions offerings, the, the ministries that we're highlighting this month to support. One is 10th Hour Project, which is a discipling uh, program for young adults. And uh, they've been here before, and they've, we've gone out with them and, and gone up to Harkness Theater and other places and just share the gospel with people, that wherever we, whoever happens to be there that night. So we're supporting them for September, so keep that in mind. And also... Tony and Lauren Finch, who are missionaries in New Mexico, and they're missionaries to the Tara Umara Indian tribe down there in Mexico. And so those are the two mission, uh, two ministries that we're highlighting this month. So that's for September. So September's still here. So you can still give. Here comes Pastor Pat. Hello. Hi. Good to see you guys. Welcome. I'm um, just getting back. Uh, the last few days, I've been up at uh, Tonto Rim uh, Christian Camp for a uh, men's a men's retreat, which was just fantastic, just unbelievable. Just what the Lord did is a picture of all the guys that went. Uh, pastor David Landry joined us uh, for a couple of days. He's the founding pastor here, the one whom I replaced, and it was a joy to see him. But but just you know the presence of the Lord. Uh, the work that God did, getting to know some of the men that, uh, you know, I, I've known them a bit, but then being able to interact with them and hear their stories, uh, just such a sweet time, such a sweet time. So uh, for those that prayed for us, thank you for that. And, um, you know, when these opportunities come around like this, uh, just I encourage you to take advantage of them. Just, it's always good to get away for a couple days, you know, worship the Lord, get to know other, one another. It's, um, it's uh, special. Uh, ladies, there are uh, several events that are going on here at the church that you can be a part of. Um, all kinds of Bible studies. We have a women's, women's Bible study, mom's group, single women's group, women's prayer group. Uh, I think we're just starting here a walking, hiking group. Uh, my wife oversees the women's ministry here, so there's some information available for you out in the, uh, out in the, uh, the lobby there. So take advantage of that. Uh, church is not just Sunday, amen? Church is being out in the world, in your neighborhood, in your workplaces, and just being the church, loving one another, uh, doing community together, sharing your life. Uh, don't do life alone. Uh, have some good friends uh, with you that share your values, that love the Lord, and um, just God is so good. All right. I am getting set up here. There we go. Uh, we have here at Calvary Chapel on Sundays been uh, talking about life's big questions. So over the last several weeks, we've talked about what happens after death. Why is there evil and suffering in the world? What is the purpose of life? How can I be happy? We have taken a look at each of these questions from a biblical perspective. The biblical worldview is the only worldview that really makes sense. So I encourage you, if any of those questions pique your interest or you've thought about them, uh, maybe struggled with them and you haven't been here, you haven't heard that message, would encourage you to go on our YouTube channel or our website and 
check those out. I think we should all be equipped to answer those questions of our neighbors, friends. Uh, we need to learn critical thinking and have these type of conversations with people. And then over the course of the last several weeks, we've given opportunity to receive any other questions that you might have uh, related to anything at all. What does the Bible say about different issues and whatnot? And, uh, and so you have been faithful to either text or email in questions. And so today what I'm going to do uh, in a very creatively entitled message called 10 More Questions, <laughs> we're going to answer those questions. And uh, um, so just a, a couple uh, precursors before we jump in here is that my, my, uh, my effort here is to uh, share what the Bible says about various topics, uh, to provide um, these answers based on the entirety of what Scripture teaches, then also uh, we'll reflect upon the character of God as we think about these answers as well. Then I also want to say that each question could be an entire sermon. Uh, and so my answers uh, will be somewhat brief, some briefer than others. And I'll try to be thorough. I'll try to provide a good, solid, thorough answers. But they certainly will not be comprehensive. So I'm not going to say everything that could be said on any particular topic. Uh, and then lastly, I want this message to be an inspiration to you that when you do have questions, you know, go to God's word. Go to God's word and say, well, what does the Bible say about this? All right, you ready to jump in? Hey, listen, if you're here today and, uh, and you don't know who God is, you don't have any kind of a relationship with him, uh, I want to thank you for being here I'm, and I want you to feel welcome. Uh, this is a place full of people that love you, that love God. And we're all on a journey trying to be closer to God. So everyone's welcome here. And, uh, and so if, if you have an open heart, even if you haven't thought of these questions before, if you have an open heart here and you just want to be closer to God, God's going to meet you. God's going to meet you right where you're at. He's going to reveal more of himself to you. And then uh, this day could change your life. Amen. All right, Father, thank you. Thank you because you are here. Thank you because you love us. You've spoken to us. You provided Jesus to die on the cross for us. We lift him up today. We've sang to you, Lord. We've worshiped you. We want to continue in that attitude as we approach uh, these questions. Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Question number one. Uh, how do you practically live in the power of God? It's a good question. Uh, whenever you think of power, think of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, verse 14, which is the temptation of Jesus, when Jesus began his ministry, before he started his ministry, the Holy Spirit led him into the desert uh, for 40 days, and he was tempted by Satan. When those 40 days were over, Luke 4, 14 says that he returned to Galilee filled with with the Spirit's power, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Uh, then at the end of Luke's gospel, when Jesus um, was speaking to his disciples, he said, I will send the Holy Spirit. This is Luke 24, 49. I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So the Holy Spirit comes and fills the disciples with power. Now before Jesus ascended to heaven in the Gospel of John, I believe, it says that Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so they received the Holy Spirit. That's the point when the disciples became Christians. The Holy Spirit came to live within them. So, and then he says, go to Jerusalem and wait for, the, wait for the promise, wait for the Holy Spirit. But wait a minute, he already breathed on them. They had the Holy Spirit. Well, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus, Jesus said, hang on here, let me fix this. I hear it rubbing. But Jesus said, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. So they already received the Spirit. 
the end of the Gospels, but then in Acts chapter 1, he says, wait for the Holy Spirit. Different preposition. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. So Holy Spirit within every Christian, Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? So that you can be his witness. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. As you look then throughout the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4, for example, it says the apostles were giving testimony with great power. So they had power to speak forth uh, the word of Jesus. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with great boldness. So they had this power because of the Holy Spirit. Stephen in Acts chapter 6 was called a man full, a man full of grace and power. Uh, in Romans chapter 14, verse 13, it says, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace. Have you ever had joy and peace? Fill you completely with joy and peace from God because, how does it happen? You trust in him. You trust in him, you're given joy and peace. And then it says, then you will overflow with confident hope. Sounds like faith, right? Confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So have you ever wondered, how can I have, have hope in the midst of despair? Because of the Holy Spirit, power of God. How can you share, how can I get up here every Sunday? By the Holy Spirit, right? Uh, the, the Bible says that we have, we have power to say no to sin. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Power to preach and to speak on God's behalf. Um, uh, and you might say, Pastor, I don't feel bold. I don't feel strong. Well, listen, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, he said, my grace is all you need. My power is made perfect or my power works best in weakness. So if you're weak, depend upon the Lord and he'll give you that power. And, uh, and so this is, this is the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is how you walk in power. This is how you can have power over sin, how you can have power. Uh, maybe an illustration would help at this point. Maybe a story about how this practically works. Friday night, it's at the men's conference. Uh, I'm sitting in the back uh, and we had a time after all the messages were done that day it's a time of worship, time of prayer, a time of what we call an afterglow. That word comes from uh, the Lord appearing to Moses, and God told Moses, you can't look at my face, but you will see my glory when you look after I pass by, the afterglow of the Lord. So this is typically a time where um, uh, the, the, the room is open uh, just for anyone to share. If the Lord speaks, if the Lord shows you something, if the Lord puts a verse on your heart, if, if there's a word from the Lord, maybe that God might give you uh, different spiritual gifts, a time of being together following the, the leading of the Lord. And the, the pastor was teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he said, you know, the other pastors will be up front if anybody wants to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, the pastors will be here to pray for you. Well, I, I sensed from the Lord that I was just to stay in the back of the room and just to sit and, and observe and just take in. Not really sure why, but I just didn't really feel like God wanted me to go up front. And so I did. And, and I told, I was with my friend, uh, Pastor Don, Don Aldana. He's been here before. He's taught here before. And I said, hey, Don, just so you know, uh, I know they asked the pastors to go forward, but I just really feel like the Lord would have me to stay back here. What? Trying to follow the Holy Spirit, trying to be obedient to the Lord. And, uh, and, and so, so I'm just sitting there, and I was kind of just hoping nobody would come and talk to me. But a couple people just came, and they were asking me questions about, uh, about you know, the Holy Spirit and whatnot. And I'm happy. I mean, I love talking about these things with people. And, uh, and so I was sharing with them. And then I saw my friend Don get up, and he didn't go up with the other pastor. He's kind of just walking around, and then I'm engaged in this conversation. And the next thing I know, Pastor Don's up front talking on the microphone to the whole group. And I can't do two things at once. I don't know if you can, but I, I couldn't really listen to him and be engaged. And I wanted to give uh, the, the brothers that were talking to me, I wanted to give them my full attention. But I heard him say, I heard him say something about, uh, you know, there's someone here and, and uh, you, you know, you, you were abused as a kid. And you, you have to forgive. And I wasn't exactly sure what was going on, but it sounded, I wanted to be engaged. But, and, then, and then he came back and he sat next to me. And then the next thing I know, a, a man... Um, Man came over, and again, people are praying and sharing scriptures. There's a lot going on, a lot of activity. Then a man came over, said something to Don, and, and, and they're talking and praying together, and, uh, and I'm engaged in this conversation. When, when I was done talking, uh, Don told me, he said, this is the man. This is the one. I'm like, well, what's going on? So what Don did is he felt the Lord telling him that there was someone in the room that, that had been abused uh, when they were a little child. 
and that, that, that they had not forgiven that person and that they've been carrying around unforgiveness and bitterness their whole life because they haven't forgiven somebody that has abused them. Uh, and so Don shared that. And, keep, and Don shared it in the fear of the Lord because uh, it takes courage to say something like that in, in a group full of men. And interestingly, another individual was sharing about fear and, and not letting fear cripple you. I don't know exactly what they were saying. And, and that motivated Don to go share what he did. Uh, well, wouldn't you know it, but this man that came over and talked to Don said that uh, when he was eight years old, uh, that somebody abused him. And it was pretty bad. I'm not going to share all the details. Um, but he said for 38 years, he was carrying around unforgiveness and bitterness and hurt. And, uh, and that night he let it go and he forgave his abuser. And, uh, and it was amazing to watch this man and, and, and Don was just weeping and he said, look at him. And he was just over there. His face was glowing. He was worshiping the Lord. He'd only been saved about a year. He was living on the street, got saved. And, uh, just, it's so amazing. That's the power of the Holy Spirit, folks. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is not reserved for pastors. You know, the Bible is clear. And so if you want to experience the power of God, you know, ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Say, God, I want all that you have for me. Fill me with your spirit. Give me power over sin in my life. Give me power. Show me what you want me to show me. And there may, you may come to church and start doing this. Come to church not just to receive but come to church saying, Lord, what do you have for me today? Is there somebody you want me to encourage? Is there somebody you want me to pray for? Do you have a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom? We're going to be starting 1 Corinthians in a few weeks. And, uh, and as we go through 1 Corinthians, there's sections in there about spiritual gifts and operating in the power of the Spirit. So I would encourage you to, to seek the Lord as it relates to those things. Well, I said that each of these questions could be a sermon, and that one almost turned into a whole sermon. Uh, I'll just leave you with a couple verses. Uh, Ephesians 3.20, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us. That power is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. He's able to accomplish infinitely more than we ask or think. And then uh, 2 Peter 1.3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. And then that, that verse goes on. So be filled with the Spirit. Uh, trust the Lord and allow him to give you power to say no to sin to walk in victory, to do ministry, to be a witness, to tell others about Christ. All right, question number two is uh, regarding mental health. Uh, is my mental health partially to blame for my ungodly behavior? It's a good question, isn't it? Uh, let me read, because I, I summarized that just for the sake of putting it on the screen, but let me read this, the whole question to you so that you understand the heart behind the question. Uh, my question is related to mental health and behavior. My family has suffered with mental health issues like depression and mood disorders. I struggle with a mood disorder. I look at my own sanctification and some of my behavior is not Christ-like. I feel that much of my behavior is under my control. However, should I remind myself that some of it may not be? Or is that just an excuse? That's a great, great, fantastic question. Um, and, and in that question, you realize that there's somebody that says... I'm doing stuff that's not right, that's ungodly, and I don't know if I should take full responsibility for it because I have a mental health issue, so should I, should I kind of go easy on myself and, and realize that, you know, maybe I don't have all the, the control I need over this, or is that just, or am I just making an excuse for it? So there's a good heart behind that question. Now, let me say that I'm not a, a doctor and I'm not a therapist. I'm not a mental health expert. Uh, by any means, but there's a lot of people in my life uh, that I know that are, are friends um, and uh, loved ones uh, that struggle in different mental health areas. And so um, I'm going to approach this question from a pastoral uh, perspective and looking at what Scripture says. And as I mentioned earlier, putting all this together, the character of God, what the Bible says, and uh, all the years I've been in ministry, I've seen many, many different uh, different people that deal with all kinds of different issues related to this. When one of my children, uh, well, okay, so let's let's take this question, um, and let's let's uh, 
take away the mental health component of it. And let's, let's just say, am I responsible for my ungodly behavior, for my unchristlike behavior? Is, is that my responsibility? Um, well, what controls behavior? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, when one of my kids was little, we had to discipline them because they did something they ought not to do. And, uh, and as we're discussing this particular behavior, uh, they were overcome with grief. It was so cute. And, and, and they said, I just can't help it. And I said, exactly. That's your sinful nature. We have a predisposition to sinful behavior. You can't help but sin. Amen? Is that true? Have you experienced that? Or am I the only one? <laughs> so does that void me of responsibility? No. It doesn't void me of responsibility. Am I responsible for all of my actions? 100% yes, I am. Uh, now, James chapter 1, verse 14 talks about this. It says, temptation comes from our desires. Um, these desires give birth to sin, sin grows, and sin eventually leads to death. Uh, maybe a more appropriate scripture would be Ezekiel chapter 18, uh, verse 20. Ezekiel 18, 20 says, the person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins. The parents will not be punished for the child's sin. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior. Wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. Ezekiel 18, 20, important verse, which teaches us that every single person is responsible for their righteous behavior or their wicked behavior. Now, what are the consequences of uh, unrighteous behavior, of ungodly or unchristlike behavior? What are the, the consequences of that? There's an eternal consequence, which is death and hell. Now, that consequence has been taken care of by Christ. So you do not, you are not responsible. If you're a Christian, if you've given your life to Jesus, you're not responsible for the eternal consequences of your actions because Christ paid for that. Now, there are also earthly consequences for immoral, ungodly, unchristlike behavior. Uh, so... Uh, if we bring the mental health piece back into this and we say, okay, what is the reason for my behavior that's not Christ-like? What role does my mental health, uh, especially if I have a diagnosis, uh, is, is that partially to blame for my behavior? And the answer may be, well, maybe it is. Maybe your mental health does affect your behavior in a, in a certain negative way. And then we ask the question, are you still responsible for that behavior? And the answer is yes. You are. Now, we already talked about the eternal consequences. Okay, so that's, that's not an issue because the blood of Christ, Jesus takes care of that. It's a salvation issue. Uh, but if, if my actions, uh, you know, affected by my sinful nature, but also affected by my mental health, and we'll talk about some other uh, um, factors, but if, if, if my actions, my behavior negatively affects someone, I hurt someone and I don't mean to hurt them, you know, whether it's through saying something to them or, or some, I just do something and I don't mean to, but it hurts them. It affects them negatively. So I asked a friend of mine who uh, struggles with this, and, and I asked him about this question to see his response because he's closer to it than, than I would be. And, and he says, listen, if I do something and I didn't mean to do it and I hurt somebody, I apologize to them. I own my actions and I tell them I'm sorry and I thank them for bringing it to my attention and I try to make things right. But they also said, but if I do something and I feel convicted by it, by the Holy Spirit, then I know it, it, that I am responsible because the Holy Spirit had just convicted me of it. Okay, so there's several factors that affect behavior. This is going a bit bigger picture now. Let's think about this because mental, there is a mental health epidemic in our culture and I think even in the church and in a room like this in our church, I'm sure... Uh, many of you have walked through uh, many situations with, with mental health. And so I just want to address this uh, from a pastoral perspective because it is so important. Uh, there are several factors that affect behavior. And I'm going to talk about five different areas in our lives that can affect our behavior. Uh, number one, and, and so, so what I want to do, like with each of these areas, let's make sure that you're doing well in all of these areas. Okay? So the first area is a spiritual area. We all have a spiritual life. Uh, that's our relationship with God. So how is your current relationship with God? How about your prayer? Are you spending time praying? 
uh, what role does scripture play in your life? Uh, are you meditating before you're medicating? I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't medicate. Don't misunderstand me. But let's start with meditation on scripture. Let's start with, with memorizing scripture. The key to memorizing scripture is to find verses that address the issue that you're struggling with. Uh, if you're struggling with lust, find verses about purity and holiness. If you're struggling with anger, find verses about peace and anger. If you're struggling with wandering thoughts or, or, or anxiety, you know, find, memorize verses that say, do not be anxious about anything. And, and just start getting God's word into you. His word is a wonderful counselor. Okay, so, so let's deal with that spiritual area of our lives. Make sure you're in Christian community. Make sure you're, you're coming to church. So take care of your spiritual part of your life. The second factor I say that affects behavior is your physical life. Uh, and I'm speaking here of uh, your diet. If all you're eating is junk food, that's going to negatively affect your mental health. Uh, fill up a bunch of 10-year-olds with sugar and see what happens. Their, their diet, <laughs> yeah, the teachers are like, yes, <laughs> preach, brother. The, 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 uh, the sh the, 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 what you take in, what you eat, affects your, affects your behavior. Uh, what about exercise? You know, are you, are you getting your heart pumping and your blood flowing? Are you going for, for walks? Are you walking rapidly? Are, are, you, are you increasing? Are you doing exercise? Something. Just something every day. Doing some push-ups, some sit-ups. Just, just getting your blood flowing, doing some exercise. Exercise is going to improve your mental health. It's going to be a boost to your mental health. Uh, what about vitamins and supplements and, and nutrition and all of that? So, again, I'm not a, not a doctor. I'm not giving you medical advice or nutrition advice or anything. Well, I guess I'm giving you nutrition advice, but I guess I just have to disclaim that. But, but, uh, but make sure you're taking care of yourself spiritually, physically. Uh, another area is emotionally. How's your emotional health? This is a big deal. Um, when you get bad news, it can affect your behavior. I had a, an experience a number of years ago when um, I got news from a friend of mine that a pastor that I respected, was influenced by, had made a big impact in my life. I loved him, um, modeled much of what I did in ministry after him. I got news that he had uh, committed adultery and he, he lost his ministry. Now, we hear things like this all the time, but, but I was impacted by this man. I'd, I'd sat under his teaching for years and years and years, and in many ways, I considered him my pastor, had a, had a deep connection to him. And, and that bad news, that devastating news, affected me. In fact, even weeks after that, I found myself getting angry and lashing out verbally, I think, at one of my children. Uh, and normally, I wouldn't do that, uh, but because of this bad news, and I was angry about it, it affected my behavior. I'm still responsible for my behavior, but that bad news affected my behavior. You get bad news, it can affect your behavior. You get good news, it can affect your behavior. You have to be emotionally healthy. You have to be aware of your emotions. There's a, um, a friend that I have, and uh, he had a problem with outbursts of wrath. Uh, that's a sin. It's a work of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5. So, so this outburst of wrath, you know, you know what that's like. You're... In a meeting, and, and just, ah, da, 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 just, you just get angry. And, uh, and so I, I talked to him one time about this, and I said, listen, um, when, you, when you get angry, something happens before you lash out, before you, before you start you know, spewing a bunch of garbage and start yelling at somebody. Something happens in your heart. Your, your heart starts beating fast. Your pulse goes up. You start to feel that fire. You know what I'm talking about? You're, you're, you're getting upset. So I said, catch yourself when that starts happening. And instead of lashing out, just say something like, hey, I'm starting to get upset right now. I'm starting to get upset, and I just need, I just need to walk away. I just need a break. What is that? That's emotional health. That's being aware of your emotions. And, and, uh, and so we, we need that. We need to be emotional healthy. All right, spiritual, physical, emotional. Uh, another factor that affects our behavior, another area of our life is relational. Do you have friends? Are you living alone? 
Uh, or, and I don't mean by living alone. You could live with other people, but you're very lonely, and you don't, you're not connected. Uh, we are created to be with one another. So you, you have to have good friends. This is why we have a whole ministry here of groups that meet in homes all over, all over the place uh, so that you can be connected with other people. You have to have good friends. You have to uh, connect with others uh, relationally. So make sure you have good friends. Now, if all of those are um, where they need to be, maybe not perfect, but, but you've got all of that taken care of. Now, now let's talk about mental health. Now let's talk about your mind. And the Bible has a lot to say about your thoughts and your mind. Uh, and, and as we've already talked about all these different areas, if there's still some issues, you know, with depression, anxiety, panic attacks, mood disorders, all of this, uh, then you might want to uh, get some counseling, get some, get some people that are really understand these things. Uh, I, I know several Christian people that are godly people, and they take medication for uh, mental health conditions. And so it is not unspiritual if you need medication for your mental health. But don't over-medicate yourself. Uh, make sure that, that you're taking care of yourself in all of these other areas. Uh, but sometimes it's a little bit of medication that can help us uh, with, with, with some of this, this thinking. And if you're on medication and you want to get off your medication because maybe you've just heard some of this and, and, and it's the first time you've heard it, don't just stop taking medication. Right? You want to do that under the care of a doctor and, and have some good conversations around that. Uh, if you need help, uh, we have some people in the church that can help you that are licensed professionals and they'd be happy to sit down and talk with you. So just email our office or, or give us a call. Now with all of this, coming back to the question, is my mental health partially to blame for my ungodly behavior? I think we've addressed that. But related to this, I want to say we want to avoid a victim mentality. Yeah. We, we, want, we don't want to be victims. Nobody here is a victim. Now, maybe you've, you've, maybe you've been a victim, right? Maybe people have abused you or you, you've, you've received, you know, uh, hurtful actions from others. But don't get stuck in a victim mentality. In other words, uh, don't, don't think that you're not responsible for your actions because you're being triggered by somebody. And it's their fault that you're acting like this. Don't think that, well, because I've been oppressed or I'm being oppressed that now I can retaliate and I can oppress you and I can hurt you because I've been hurt by you. Don't think because of all the abuse I endured, I can now hurt you or I can abuse you. That's not biblical, folks. That's not godly. That, the Bible doesn't teach that. Don't think that because of all the abuse I've endured that now I should be coddled by you. Or I'm entitled for, you know, to be, no, 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 no. Rise up, take responsibility for your actions, own them. I mean, I work on this in parenting all the time. It's not his fault, it's not her fault, you be responsible. Be a man, be a woman, do the right thing. Okay, uh, question number three. Uh, I struggle to find ways to glorify God. How can I live to glorify God? What a great question. Uh, glorify God by obeying God. The greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's in Matthew chapter 22. This is how you glorify God, by loving him with all your heart. You want to glorify God? Go into all the world and make disciples. Teach people to obey Jesus. If you want to glorify God, pray. Work on your prayer life. Read your Bible. Share Jesus with people. Fight against evil. Uh, you want to glorify God? Um, run for city council. Three council seats open. Run for city council. Glorify God by serving your city. You want to glorify God? Fight against evil. Contribute to human flourishing. Protect the innocent. That's how you glorify God. All right, number four. I struggle with assurance of salvation. Can you help me? Yes, I can help you with assurance of salvation. Um, here's, here's how we're going to do this. Make sure you're saved. <laughs> you want assurance of salvation? Let's start with salvation. Make sure that you're saved. God loves the world so much, or in this manner, God loves the world, that he gave Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. Whoever believes in Jesus, uh, whoever gives their allegiance to Jesus, whoever follows Jesus, forgiven. So make sure you're following Jesus. Give him your life. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
uh, if you're saved, make sure that the eternal condition of your soul is taken care of. Now, if you say, yes, done that, check, yes and amen, then say, okay. Now, if you're st still struggling with assurance of salvation, let's talk about sin. Do you have an unconfessed sin in your life? Watching porn. Are you getting angry? Is there some secret sin that you have? Are you, are you cheating? I mean, just is, is, there, is there some sin in, sin in your life? Bring it into the light. Confess it. Find a trusted uh, friend or pastor or leader. Confess your sin. Nobody's going to think any less of you. Now, if, you, if you've done that, you're still struggling with assurance of salvation, uh, then I would say 1 John 1, 9. Memorize this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If this is a big struggle, your assurance of salvation, write that verse down, text it to yourself, write it on a paper, put it on a mirror, memorize it, say it every day, say it every time you eat dinner, say that, say that verse every time you eat a meal, and, uh, and God will begin to take that lack of assurance away. All right, question number five. And I'm going to read the whole question. They're just going to put part of it up on the screen. Um, the Bible tells us to honor our father and mother. How can we do so when they are alcoholic, drug abusers, and narcissistic and don't want to change their ways of living? How can we still honor them? Help. Now, um, for you that wrote this question, it sounds like you have tried to minister to them. It sounds like you have tried to help them change. This is a very mature question. I'm assuming this is um, from uh, children of parents, uh, and the, uh, well, that you're an adult child of parents, that you've already left the home, and, and this is uh, your question. Or maybe it's coming from a mature teenager, um, which is a fantastic mature teenager if they're as asking this question. Um, so let's talk about honor. To honor someone means that you are being respectful in how you uh, speak and in how you act towards them. Uh, so, for example, if there's somebody here who's a drug-abusing narcissist and, and I'm relating to them, I honor them by speaking and acting in a way that is honorable. For instance, I would tell them something like, listen, you need to stop what you're doing. You need to put that away. You need to change your lifestyle. If this doesn't change, I'm leaving and I'm not going to help you. You need to get help. I'm willing to find help for you, but you need to, you need to change your way. So I'm, I'm being honorable towards them, right? The way to be dishonorable towards them would be to yell at them, be mean to them, belittle them, criticize them. That's dishonorable behavior. So do you see how honor, dishonor is in, how I, is in my disposition, not necessarily theirs? Uh, now, if, if, uh, if you're a child or a teenager, you're living with your parents, uh, you have to obey them. The Bible says to obey them as long as they're not telling you to do something contrary to God's will or God's word. Uh, if they tell you to do your homework, you have to do your homework. If they tell you to go to bed, you have to go to bed. If they tell you to eat your vegetables, you have to eat your vegetables, right? If, uh, if they pull in front of a drugstore and they tell you to go inside and steal some NyQuil for them, uh, you say, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to steal because the Bible says not, not to steal. And, you know, I doubt there's many parents that would tell their kids to do that. Um, but what about this? Tell them I'm not home. In other words, somebody calls, somebody comes to the door, and, uh, and you tell your, your son or daughter, tell them I'm not here. Okay? So you're going to ask your son to lie for you. You're going to ask them to lie for you? No. Then, then the child is, needs to respond to the parent, uh, I mean, you don't open the door and say, well, they told me to tell you that they're not here, <laughs> but I don't lie, so I'm really not going to, I mean, you don't do that, right? But respectfully, you say, mom, dad, I'm not going to lie for you. The Bible says that we shouldn't lie. I'm happy to tell them you're not available or you're not able to see them at this time, but I'm not going to lie for them. Okay, so honor doesn't mean that you obey them without condition. Honor doesn't mean... Um, uh, that you are obligated to do whatever they tell you. Uh, and going back to the adult child of parents that are um, narcissistic, alcoholic, drug abusing, that, that type of situation, uh, it is not honoring to enable that behavior. And is, it is not honoring to give them money. It is not honoring to, um, uh, to be manipulated. 
okay? Don't enable people. Don't give them money. Try to help them. Try to get them into a program. Uh, invite them to church. The Holy Spirit is here. The Holy Spirit might work in their life. They may repent and give their life to the Lord. Um, but th- this brings up another issue of um, living under abuse, being abused by somebody. And sometimes there's a mistaken, uh, a mistaken perspective from a wife that may be getting abused by her husband. And she's like, well, the Bible says wives submit to your husbands. And so my husband's abusing me. The Bible says I have to submit to my husband, so I'm submitting to his abuse. See the logic? Uh, okay, but let's think about this. Do you honor your husband first or do you honor God first? You honor God first. So if God's heart is contrary to your husband, whom are you obligated to obey? You're obligated to obey God. How is it honoring to God to let somebody else abuse you? That doesn't honor God because you're enabling that person to sin against you and to sin against God. So if you're being abused by someone, that dishonors God because it's promotion of that person's sin. Um, So you should not honor a human being at the expense of dishonoring God. Does that make sense? So if you've been abused or you've been hurt or you're currently in that situation, uh, get out of an abusive situation and we'll help you. If you need help, we'll help you. Um, But after the fact, if you have been, maybe that's all in the rearview mirror and you have been abused, you have been hurt by your parents or other authority figures, Uh, Let's make sure that now you're trusting in God, that you're on a good course of learning about your loving Heavenly Father. Sometimes it's hard to think of God as a father because your father abused you, but listen, God is everything your father never was. God loves you beyond anything you could ever imagine. You know what evil looks like. Flip that over and look at what perfectly good, what's a perfect father in your eyes? that's, That's your picture of who God is. Uh, Psalm 68 verse 5 says that God is a father to the fatherless. He's a defender of widows. And then if this is, if this is your situation, this goes back to an illustration I shared earlier. Um, one, once you're on a good course of learning about your heavenly father, uh, there might be some forgiveness. You might need to work on forgiving your abuser, forgiving your narcissistic alcoholic parents and forgiving them. Uh, practically, you know, if you're relating If it's an ongoing relationship, you can listen to them, cultivate in your heart an attitude of compassion, but create safe boundaries uh, so that you can reduce sinful temptations for them and for you. So you don't want to put yourself in uh, um, temptations that might lead you to sin. Forgiveness and honor does not equate with, uh, um, with permanent submission to parental authority. So don't feel guilty in keeping your distance from abusive parents. Okay, I hope that helps. All right, number six. Uh, Now we move more into theological and eschatological. That's a big word, eschatological. Eschaton, which means the end times. So it's talking about some of the things that uh, happen in the end times. But first we have this theological question. How could sin arise in this... uh, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit. How could sin arise in the perfectly holy environment of heaven? Here's a question about the source of evil. Where did evil come from? Uh, So we know that God is absolute good and absolutely good. So how could evil uh, be sourced in a perfectly good God? God created all of the angels. The angels were perfect creatures. So how could a perfect creature do evil? Well, God created only good things. One good thing that he created is free will. Free will is a good thing. Uh, And free will makes evil possible. God did not create evil. He created free will. And because he created free will and uh, temporarily gave free will to the angels, uh, one of the angels in particularly, Lucifer, we know him as Satan, chose to use his free will to ascend the throne of God and try to take over. There's another question that has to do with the, um, uh, with Lucifer. So I'll talk about that later, but the reason um, of how could sin arise in this perfectly holy environment of heaven uh, is because that God created free will. 
The reason God created free will is because you cannot have love without a choice. You can't force anybody to love you and you can't be forced to love anybody. So you have to have free will. Free will makes evil possible. You can't have love without evil. Does that make sense? All right. And the, the angel's destiny at this point is sealed. Satan will never repent. Demons don't, you know, they don't read the Bible and decide they're going to stop being demons. Their fate has been sealed. Their destiny is sealed. Okay, next question, number seven. Are there different levels in heaven? Does your assignment to different level or do, um, is your assignment to different levels based on performance and or the Bema Seat judgment, which is the judgment of rewards for the believer? If so, will we see different or will we see people on different levels? Uh, there's nothing in the Bible to indicate that, the, that there's any levels in heaven. Uh, there's some teaching in the Mormon church that says there's levels in heavens. Uh, Dante's Inferno, I think, talks about different levels in heaven. Uh, the Bible makes mention of third heaven, which is 2 Corinthians 12, 2, where Paul writes, I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Uh, the third heaven, though, is the abode of God. That's where God is. Uh, the first heaven is what you'll see when you leave this building and you look up into the sky. Uh, you won't see it here, but you'll see it outside. Uh, the second heaven would be outer space, the sun, the moon, the stars. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven would be the abode of God. So there's no levels in heaven, although the Bible does say there are different rewards in heaven. Okay, number eight. Uh, why would God, knowing all things, create Lucifer, knowing he would rebel? So we dealt with that a little bit. Um, or did his rebellion catch God off guard, necessitating a plan B? Uh, his rebellion did not catch God off guard, and there is no plan B. Um, so why would God, knowing all things, create Lucifer, knowing he would rebel? So I already talked about the why with that, uh, but let me just give you some scripture about, um, about Satan. So uh, this is the origin of Satan. Uh, Ezekiel 28, chapter 13, says this about Satan. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned, goes on to say... Um, um, beautifully, you know, beautiful angelic being. Verse 14, I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God. Uh, verse 15, you were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. It's talking about Lucifer, Ezekiel 28. Uh, and then that, that passage goes on uh, to talk about how uh, Lucifer sinned. In verse 16, it says, I banished you. In disgrace from the mountain of God, I expelled you. Um, verse 17, your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor, so I threw you to the ground. Isaiah 14 is another passage that you want to write down if you want to take a deeper look at this. Where Isaiah writes in verse 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world, for you said to yourself, this is Satan now, I will ascend to heaven, set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. So Satan wanted to take over. He wanted to be God. And so he was cast down. Okay. Let's see. The Bible says that Satan is a fallen angel. Um, he's ruler of the kingdom of um, let's see. He's ruler of the kingdom of CNN. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> MSNBC. No, I'm not. I'm sorry. Fox. No, no, no. Uh, he is ruler of the kingdom of the air. He is the prince of this world. Do you know that the Bible says Satan's the prince of this world? Second yeah. Corinthians four four says he's the god of this age kind of starts to make sense when you look at our culture, doesn't it? That Satan, Satan's, this, this is what a world would look like. Not entirely, but this is Satan's agenda is moving, is marching on. Okay. All right. Uh, question number nine, where does the unbeliever go before the white throne judgment? So the white throne judgment is that final judgment. It's what we think of when we think of God judging everyone. Uh, it's the judgment unto condemnation. Uh, it's spoken about in Revelation chapter 20. Uh, I won't read it all, but uh, it talks about John seeing this great white throne. 
and God sitting on the throne. The earth and the sky are gone. Uh, the dead all stand before the throne. The books are opened, and the dead are judged based on what they've done, uh, according to their deeds. Now, nobody at, the second, nobody at the great white throne is a believer. These are all unbelievers, and they're all thrown into the lake of fire. So the question is, and, and that happens at the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation 20. So there's a lot that happens before that. So the question is, what about like all the people that died in the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, like all the people that have died as unbelievers, where do they go? We know their body decomposes, but you are not your body. You are your soul. So where does your soul go? It's a good question, right? Where does your soul go? Because the great white throne judgment is not yet. It's, it's way in the future. There's a couple different views on this theologically. This is called what theologians say as the intermediate state, which is the state of the soul between physical death and the resurrection. A couple different views on this. Uh, one view is that God is outside of time. So once you get outside of the realm of the earth, uh, it seems to all happen at once. Okay, but the other view would be that uh, the, 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 the unbelievers that die go to a place called Hades, which is the abode of the wicked dead. So it's not what we think of as hell, but it is a place where God is not. Uh, it's where the unrighteous go for a period between death and resurrection. And there's verses that you can look at there. But, uh, but the, and then Gehenna is what we call the lake of fire, which we think of as hell. And so um, Hades and Gehenna would be two different places. They would both be without the absence of God. But Hades, you could think of it more as like a waiting room or a holding tank, if you will, a place where where you're, they're waiting to be judged. Some people say there's two different parts of Hades. There's a part where, uh, for the unrighteous and part for the righteous. I'm not sure that's true. I understand why people get that. Uh, but Paul wrote to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So when a Christian dies, they're immediately in the presence of the Lord. When the unbeliever dies, they're in this place called Hades. Then on judgment day, they get cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Um, I gave another message on how, if you look on our website, um, it's either in First or Second Thessalonians where I talk more about that. Okay, last question. Could you elaborate on the last part of Revelation 2.17? In heaven, are we to get new names along with our new bodies? So let me read the last part of Revelation 2.17 where it says, I will give to each one a white stone and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. That sounds kind of cool, right? In heaven, and God gives you a white stone, and on that stone is a name that he's giving you. You're being named by God. That sounds kind of cool. And it does seem biblically that in heaven we do get a new name. Now let's talk about names for just a minute. In antiquity, ancient times, names uh, meant more then than they do now. Uh, to when parents name their children today, they just pick a name that sounds cool, that they like, they like how it sounds, right? That's how, that's how we name people. There might be some biblical meaning. A lot of parents name their kids after you know, Bible, Bible names. Uh, that's why um, we were planning on naming our next child Methuselah or Mephibosheth or Nebuchadnezzar, but my wife didn't, didn't want any of those names. Um, I always like the name Ariok. I really wanted Ariok. Ariok is found in the Bible. But um, maybe my next dog will name him Ariok. <laughs> Good name for a dog, right? Ariok? Anyways, um, see, the first two services didn't get that. But um, so, so in ancient times, though, a name was much more meaningful. It represented a person's character. It, it represented their whole being. And so for God to give you a new name that no one understands except for you is so beautiful, isn't it? I mean, to think that when you get to heaven that God will give you a new name. So let's, let's uh, just, I want to support this a little bit more uh, with scripture. Revelation 3.12 says, I will write on them the name of my God. They will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. Isaiah 62, 2, Isaiah 62, 2, the nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory and you will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. Isaiah 65, 15, your name will be a curse word among my people, but the sovereign Lord will destroy you and will call his true servants by another name. 
Isn't that fascinating? Think about how much God loves you that, that he's thought of a special name that has meaning and significance to you and him that it doesn't anyone else. Now, we understand this, right? We, we, have, we have special names for people we love. Kuchiku, <laughs> Honey Bunny, Love Biscuit, <laughs> Stud Muffin. I mean, there's all kinds of fun names, right? So God gives you a special name because he loves you. It's amazing to me. All right, so those were, those were 10 questions. One more question that I have for you. Actually, more than one question. Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Are you willing to renounce sin and to live your life to follow him? And you may think I'm not talking to you, but I am talking to you. Are you willing to renounce sin, to say yes to Jesus, and to surrender your life to him? Let's pray. Father, we commit our lives to you. Lord, we are yours. We give you our lives. We surrender all to you. While everybody's in an attitude of prayer, I just want to give an opportunity to anyone here who might want to ask Jesus to be your Savior. You just found yourself here. Maybe you came with a friend or you wandered in, not really sure what to expect. Listen, you're not here by ex accident. God loves you. He has a plan for your life. He created you. The best thing that you can do, the, the best setup for your, for your future is to surrender your life to him. And I want to pray with you. So if you want to ask Jesus to be your savior, would you just raise your hand right now? By raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to follow Christ. I want to give my life to Christ. Raise your hand so I can see it. And God bless you. Good move. Awesome. Anyone else? The best decision you could ever make. You're not here by accident. Father, I thank you for this precious soul that raised your hand. And I pray that right now, Lord, in this holy moment, that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would come into their life. That you would make them a new creation. For you that raised your hand, I'm just going to lead you in this prayer. You can just pray this to the Lord, dear Jesus. Please forgive me for my sin. I confess that I have not loved you the way you deserve to be loved. I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you every single day of my life. I want to follow you. I give my life to you. Come in. Dwell within me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, that deserves an applause, doesn't it? Somebody praying to give their life to the Lord. After this service, I'd like to speak with you and give you a Bible and some other material, okay? All right, let's all stand and sing as we uh, go our way. Come on, my soul, but don't you be shy on me.
Have a wonderful, blessed week. Just wanna sing the blues Feels like a song that never stops Feels like it's never gonna Gotta get that fire, fire back in my bones Before my heart, heart turns into stone So will somebody please pass the megaphone I'll shout it on the count of three Joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. Turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything, yes. God, turn it around, God, turn it around, God, turn it around. All of my heart.
and turn this thing around. Oh yes, God turn it around. God turn it around. God turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything.
I got a homesick heart, but a long ways left to go. I've been doing my part, but I ain't got much to show. So I'm asking you to show me some forgiveness. It's all for you in my pursuit of happiness. Chasing that life moving on, cause I had to prove. I've been working all night, maybe you could help me to believe This song ain't nothing if the song can't set you free So I'm asking you to show me some forgiveness It's all for you in my pursuit of happiness Sometimes you leave the ones you love But if it's love, they won't give up Cause they know war's raging And you gotta choose These days are tough, these days are long Sometimes it's hard to carry on But I hear a voice singing And I know it's true I've got He's not mad at you. He's not looking down, frowning with an attitude. Not because of what you do, but who you tether to. And they wonder why we call it good news. Here's some good theology that'll set you free. When he looks at you, he is only pleased indeed. Not because of what you do, but who you tether to. And they wonder why we call it good news. God is in a good mood. Let me just remind.